<laughs> well, I said a second. <laughs> I thought it before. You guys, I'm warning you, I got a different kind of beer that I did not realize. It was Lagunitas Maximus, and it's like a thousand percent alcohol. So I'm going to be shit based in a minute. Just giving you a awesome. You cannot go on the air shit based. Are you kidding? Aura does all the time. What are you talking it's, about? Yeah, she's, she's <laughs> always drinking while we're talking. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Jenny. Cheers, baby yes, doll. And, and so it's Deanna, right? Or is it? You are live. Diana. Diana. Oh, right. <laughs> okay, ready? We're going. Wait, actually, let me change my name on the, on the thing. So. <laughs> All right, Tony, we're ready for the music. Oh, I've, it's already been it's already been playing. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> I don't hear it. You don't hear that? No, that's not the song. <laughs> Or it's the song, but it's like eight minutes into the song. All right, let's do it again. Here we go. All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Friday. And this is a brand new show of Between the Sheets podcast. I'm your host, Gayan Bruno. You can like me. Well, of course you like me. Why would you be fucking watching? Um, <laughs> you can like my Facebook page or the Between the Sheets podcast Facebook page and follow me on Instagram at QTE Brat. Um, I changed my hair color again. I got bored, so I did some, now it's cherry red, cherry apple red or whatever they call it, candy apple. Um, but uh, thank you for joining us each week and thank you for supporting us each week. Um, we'll go on and on and on about everything that's happened this week we're not going to go in deep detail because everyone's probably sick and tired of it we just want a winner and uh, we're here to make you laugh tonight so call in 323-524-2599 so jenny and deanna make them laugh um, <laughs> um so, so if you want to call in again it's 323-524-2599 let us hear your thoughts on what's going on in the world today um if you want to make us laugh or or throw in a topic, uh, we are here. You know, we shoot from the hip, so it goes from one thing to another to another. But before I introduce our wonderful guest, we'll go around the room or around the screen, I should say, and um, introduce you to my lovely co-hosts. We have Mara Shane. Hi. Hi. Nice to see you guys and be here. Hi. Hi. Hi, Hi Mara. Mara, tell yeah. everyone what your achievement is so far. Okay, well, I've lost almost 15 pounds since July. Wow. Oh, yes, that's my one achievement. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank and, you. And then we have Cara Noble. Hello. Hello. Hello, hello. What are uh, you doing? I have an achievement this week. I just made a table. Because, <laughs> you oh. know, I, had a, I made a big Taj Mahal. So this is, I haven't done this ever before. And I just literally grouted it today and cleaned it up. And so this is my. Oh, um, that's oh. pretty. Oh. You just did that all in one day? I know. I it took oh. me about a week because it, you know, I got, it took me about a week to put all the pieces on, break the pieces, and everything. But anyway, <laughs> I don't love it, but I'm pleased wow. with it. So well, that, that's my achievement of the week. Well, congratulations! Thank you. Very good. What's your achievement of the week? And Jenny McNulty, what is your achievement of the week? <laughs> Well, I sat at a table and I was <laughs> upright most of the time. It was really very, I was proud of myself. I'm, I'm just saying, you know, it took me all week, but I did it. <laughs> <laughs> and then last but not least uh, is Cheryl Murphy. Guys, I think my achievement of the week was just trying to get some sleep with all this energy. It's so overwhelming. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here and get grounded with these you ladies. So yeah, it's all good. I mean, seriously, last night, I think I fell asleep for the first time before like 1030, I think because I was so exhausted. And then at 1.30, I slept on the couch. And then at 1.30, I woke up and I looked at the numbers and it hadn't moved. But then yeah. Georgia was doing everything live. They were like, oh, we're doing more stuff live. We're going to dump. And I'm like, okay, okay, okay. And it still didn't, I mean, it still didn't move anything yet. And then like two, then a friend of mine called me at 2.30 and I'm like, AM, I said, hello, Todd. What? Hello, Todd. And he's like, hi. And I didn't want to say, why are you calling me? He just knew when he said, you liked something on my Facebook page five minutes ago. So I knew you were up. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh. Multitasking. Multitasking. Um, so anyway, so we'll go on. But 
let's let's not keep our lovely, wonderful okay. guest who is up probably past her bedtime because she's an East Coaster. Um, it's Diana Yanis or Diana Yanis as her mother calls her and obviously <laughs> I do too, apparently. Um, she is the creator, <laughs> writer, <laughs> creator, writer and star of an, uh, the off-Broadway hit show, um, Latina Christmas Special. It uh, was in LA as well as um, it played in New York off-Broadway. She um, also is associated with Margaret Cho um, she's been off Broadway with her too in the Sensuous Woman show and Cindy Lauper and Debbie Harry and oh, it's so impressive. I mean, half the people she worked with I want to sleep with. So I, I, I don't know what's going on there. But why? I know, Jesus, but you're married. So there we go. Um, yeah. She also obviously Happy besides stuff. being a writer, producer, director and everything else under the sun, which is really, uh, some, she's an entrepreneur. She also has been on Criminal Minds, The Shield and Boston Legal and probably many others, but Criminal Minds I worked on. So that's why that went first. Um, she is Cube, first generation Cuban American, because we're gonna talk about mm. any of us that are first generation here, because um, there's a lot of similarities in me getting to know Diana briefly on the phone. Um, we just made each other laugh and I, I wasn't even trying to be funny. Um, she's an artist uh, expressing herself in a multitude of media. She's a passionate storyteller and a performer and she seeks to imbue, I like that word imbue, I'm reading right off her bio, um, imbue all her pieces with universal truth. Ooh. So nice. that is who the hell I'm we have on the show. And I have to thank Jenny McNulty. I mean, not that I had never heard of Deanna, but I have to thank Jenny for introducing me to her. A while back, prior to COVID, we were at Eve Reynolds, um, one of Eve Reynolds gatherings <clears throat> at her house and, and she's, wonderful and, and she opens up her home to musicians and artists and and comedians and just to, to express creativity so kudos to you eve and windsor presents but mm -hmm. uh jenny um i was i think i was drinking no i matter of fact i know i was drinking <laughs> and i'm walking out and jenny's like yeah, yeah let me introduce you to somebody oh. and there was diana and she goes we have to have her on the show so you know oh not even a year later um you know, because it's like, what is everybody doing? Nothing. I mean, we're all trying to do things now, like Jenny's Jenny and, and it's Cheryl and everyone's trying to do whatever they can, as well as Deanna via Zoom and internet with COVID practices. But um, I'm thinking, I'm just going to give her a shout out and see if she's ready to be on the show. And, um, and she said, yes. So thank you, Jenny McNulty, because, and this is a legal thing, but for you, I would not know her and she would not be here. So thank you, Jenny. Hey, you, are, you are welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. And you're gonna you're you're gonna thank me again. She's amaze balls. Amaze boobs. <laughs> Sorry, amaze boobs. <laughs> so so yeah. since we're on this sub old home week path, Deanna, how did you first meet Jenny McNulty? Uh, Jenny and I uh, met because actually I think it was a producer. Wasn't it Andrea Meyerson? It was, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, she had seen me in the Sensuous Woman show when we were testing it out in Los Angeles, and uh, they were working on a new concept for a show, which would be stand-up comedy followed by improv. And uh, um, I was an improv professional at the time. You know, I was yes-anding my whole friggin' <laughs> and uh, it's a great way to deal with stress, you know, and. Uh, 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 they introduced us and I said, you know, I've, I've never done stand-up comedy. I'd only done, I mean, done sketch comedy and uh, comedy films and all sorts of things, but I'd never done stand-up. And then uh, Jenny and I went and did a show in a test show in Provincetown. And uh, it was very funny because my characters were not going over well. You know, as a sketch comedy actor, I thought, well, if I do characters and these characters do monologues, it'll be a big hit. And, and it was, it was Women's Week, wasn't it, Jenny? It was a Memorial Day weekend. Baby Dyke weekend, actually. Yeah, the women in the audience were like, oh, no. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. And I, I, did, I never, I never, I just never had an audience so tough in my whole life. And <laughs> Jenny said to me at the, by the second show, or, or some, at some point, we wrote on a napkin at a pizza place oh, what my first you. set might be. And uh, we came up with some ideas 
And I walked out there, never having done stand up before, and just, well, of course, I had traveled and toured with Margaret. So I kind of had some experience. I mean, I knew what I liked in stand up comedy. And uh, I walked out there and I made some jokes about chihuahuas and <laughs> lesbians and, and, and Provincetown, and they loved it. And when we did, when we did the uh, improv afterwards, what we discovered, which was is, is a true is is truly a great thing, is that if people get to know you as a person through stand up, and then you do improv, they know the risk that you're taking and the leaps you're taking to to be something other than who you are, and they just root for you even more. So uh, that's how we met, and she's a lovely person, so we've become very good friends, and we've performed a lot together. <laughs> We've done yeah, a lot of improv they... together and she's listened to a lot of stand up from me. <laughs> <laughs> no, the picture you posted yeah, say today with the both of you are the best way to staying in the moment is the best way to sort of live right now because we don't want to think about the future. We don't want to go. Uh, right. uh. But I would think that uh, improv is about the best thing for staying in the moment because you can't possibly think about anything else. Oh, yeah. No, I see. improv is actually the most exciting adult game one could ever play you know it's like it's like um what's a game uh charades times you know a hundred it, it is it is because the stakes are higher and it's it's ever more exciting and there's also a lot of trust that has to develop between the performers um i keep thinking for some reason this i keep flashing back on this jenny remember when we were doing a show in um the town that went out of that went out of business. What was the name of the town? Stockton. Stockton yes. yes, we were doing a show in Stockton. Lovely audience, wonderful people. And the improv was first line, give us a first line of dialogue and then give us the last line of dialogue. And the fir first line, I'm gonna guess what it was, but you'll get the idea was, uh, um, where have you been all night? And then the, the last line was like, there's a fire in the bathroom or something like that. And so, I knew what I was going to do right away. And Jenny gets all prepared and she goes, where were you last night? And I go, there's a fire in the bathroom. And it gets <laughs> the the scene, you know, and we laughed and laughed, wow. laughed about it. The audience knew was in on the joke. It was the most amazing, I don't know, yeah. just wonderful feeling to be connected with them and to know that, that they knew that we were playing. Yes. <laughs> There's an element too of they like when if they, if you just go to an improv show and you sit down and you and like say the first couple of you know things that they do kind of don't go over well then you're like ah oh, these guys aren't funny but once they've seen your stand up and they already know you're funny then they're like okay we know you know what you're doing but you're really struggling right now and they sort of like enjoy when you're stuff. having those kind of moments but for the most part you know that's kind of why Andrea put us together because Diana is just an amazing improviser and is so she could do a bunch of different accents and characters and her space work is great space work is like you know like say you have a cup of tea and you've got this cup of tea through the whole scene well for me i always sort of get lazy and forget and then pretty soon i just look like i have a weird arm problem <laughs> <laughs> so, but diana is like amazing with setting the scene and giving us history uh, and backstory so it, it's it's and, and i and i would i also like coming from like an athlete i always pr i approach everything like athletics and Diana was always like, I want to rehearse. I want to, you know, do some games to practice. I want to warm up. And I'm like, okay, okay, great. Because for me, I like to, to try to, you know, be prepared. But she's, she's a, a great to work with. She's so funny. We often start off with two different accents, but then we catch yeah. different accents. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll be French. She'll be British. Somewhere in between, we're the same. Some sort of, <laughs> you know. But it is, but it is a lot of fun, and I have to say that it's been, it's been kind of a unique blessing to work with. I mean, Jenny, we've been doing it for a while, at least yeah. 10, 10, 12 years. We've been, you know, somebody gives us the opportunity, and we say, yeah, we'll do, we'll do improv, and we do it. You know, the audience always loves it. So, Deanna, getting back to sort of your history, um, you were born in Miami, no? The other Cuba, yes. The other Cuba. Yeah. I was born in the other other Cuba. Um, in right. uh, yes, I was born in Talk New Jersey. About. Yeah, I was born in Little Havana East. No, <laughs> north. Northeast. I don't know. North, northeast. Um, <laughs> so, <clears throat> growing up, well, first of all, like, well, I don't want to bring up politics, but Florida was no surprise for me. But um, unfortunately, but yeah, don't get uh, me started on that. I'm I'm really pissed about that. But yeah. Well, considering that 
you know, the old school Latinos, Cubans, you know, they're dying off. I mean, they seriously are. And they're supposedly the next generation seem to be a little bit more liberal or open minded, you know, mm -hmm. so, you know, and I know that Cubans aren't the only Latinos in Florida, I guess Venezuelans also support Trump. Mm -hmm. So I just don't understand. I guess I'll bring it out what I don't understand. I mean, he is so discriminatory. I mean, he is. He, he hates everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. He has I know. wanted to build walls for Latinos and he's wanted to. It, it just amazes me how, for example, that segment of the population of society would still want to support him. There's there's a lot of things going on there, and and I I don't want to get too serious about it because you know I could just go on and on. I mean it's one of the reasons I don't live in Miami anymore, but I do have um, I do have a lot of great Cuban American friends that think like us, are with us, are you know uh, are on our side. But I will say this: I had this discussion with one of my relatives. Uh, who is a, a big Trumper and uh, was saying that, you know, well, because, you know, we're cute, we're, you know, we're Americans, we're Americans. And I said, you know, the funny thing is, you know how when you guys refer to Asian people, you always say Chinos, you know, which is Chinese. But, you know, like when I worked with Margaret Cho, it was like, oh, because you work with Latina. And I'm like, no, she's actually Korean and that's not Chinese. And she's like, oh, you know what I mean? You know what I mean, right? And I, I said to this person, you know how you say Chino for all Asian people? Guess what Trump says for all Latino people? Mm -hmm. Mexican. Uh, yeah. You are Mexican. And this person was like, <laughs> you know, I don't look anything like a Mexican. I don't sound like a Mexican. What's the big deal? You know, and I was like, you see, to you, you seem like you're separate, but you're actually not. And the moment that you have a different opinion or you're not on his side, you are also a murderer and a rapist and someone that's come to this country to take other people's jobs. I mean, it is ridiculous that you would think that somehow he sees the difference between you and other immigrants. You know, the whole country is immigrants. None of us are really from here. I'm an immigrant. immigrant. <laughs> I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm an immigrant. Well, I'm the child of an immigrant, so yeah. I'm a first generation. But it, again, you know, even with this election, I, I just, again, I thought for sure, and I granted, you know, it was just horrifying to me when the numbers started coming in. Just horrifying that people still voted for him in mass and came out and the Republicans came out more. Well, and so, yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt no, you. you. Interrupt. It's okay. Well, my wife said something that I think is, is very true though. She said, cause I was sad about it too. I was like, what, what, you know, does this mean that 50% of the country basically hasn't progressed? We're still a country of homophobes and mm -hmm. uh, anti-immigrant racist and, and uh, you know, just these pathetic people. And, and uh, she said, you know, it's not really 50%. She said, it's maybe 20% because there's all these other people that are children that haven't gotten to voting age yet that are more aware and more um, worldly in that sense that don't give a shit if someone's gay or transgender, who don't care if that person is um, black or white or yellow or it doesn't matter. And um, it gave me a lot of hope because it really what we're seeing right now is that there are a there is a slim amount more of us than them. And um, we got to we got to root for the we got to root for the part of us that we're proud of. And and I'm proud of Biden and Harris, I have to say, I'm very proud of them. Me, too. <laughs> and isn't it the coolest thing that soon we'll be able for the first time in our lifetimes to actually say, Madam Vice President? Mm -hmm. Lovely. Mm -hmm. Nice. From here on up. From here on up. From here on up. And it's um, amazing. So, um, so, Deanna, getting back to you, in your humble beginnings in Miami, um, you were born here or you were born in Cuba? I was born in Miami Beach. <laughs> I was uh, I was uh, born at a um, 
a uh, actually a predominantly Jewish hospital, Mount Sinai. Is it Mount Sinai? I want to say Mount Sinai. No, Cedar Sinai. No, that's LA. Mount Sinai. <laughs> and uh, years later, I was working as a PA on a film, and I actually uh, was working on this documentary, and it was a documentary about the guy who founded that uh, hospital. And it was really exciting for me because my mother and father who came to this country very, very young. My father was 21, my mother was 18. My father had studied in New York for a short while, so he spoke English. But my mother could, you know, really basically, she basically thought that she was never leaving Cuba, so why should she pay attention in English class? Surprise, surprise, <laughs> you know? It's like, oh shit, she should have been paying attention. So um, they had a really uh, scary time and, uh, she just had the, the best experience at this hospital. To this day, she's always like, if we only lived closer to Mount Sinai Hospital, she Aww. just really had a good experience there. Aww. Diana, yeah. tell, tell the first joke we wrote in that pizza parlor was how your mother learned to speak English. Tell oh, me. Yeah. oh, yeah. <laughs> OK, so I, I realized that, um, and this is actually a true story. My mother did not speak English, and my my very young age, you know, my toddler years, but yeah, I don't know, maybe four or five years old. Um, my mother uh, was uh, obsessed with watching um, all my children. Mm -hmm. And um, the very first words she said to me in English, she basically that was her school was all my children. Very first word she said to me in English was, I, that Erica is evil. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's awesome. oh story. Okay, we have actually believe it, we have two callers, so let's take a one caller. Ready, Tony or Kristen? Hello? Hello, hello. Hello. I can't hear them. Are they on still? They should be in. Is that a yes or a no? <laughs> they should be in now. <laughs> Oh, someone. Hello? Hello, I hear classical music. <laughs> oh my God, smile. Are you having a stroke? <laughs> I was gonna say that might be in your brain. Okay, Tony, I guess we would drop this one. And if we dropped you, it's because we can't hear you. So call back, but Tony, is there still another one? Yes, we do. We're okay, let's try that one. Right Hello, welcome to Between the Sheets. Who's calling? Come up my butt. I want it. Uh. Oh, that kind of caller. You really do attract an interesting crowd, Deanna. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so anyway, me. I mean, I said I wanted to hear, but I didn't want porn. So um, if you really have a call or a, a question or you want to contribute to any of us here, 323-524-2599. So continue, Deanna. So your mother learns how to... Um, Speak English from young went to, she went to illustrious school of all my children. <laughs> okay. And that's how learned to speak our language, our, our illustrious language. I think my and, grandmother did too. I think my grandma, but she obviously she's way older than your mom. But my grandmother, I think she started watching Edge of Night as the world turns. As the world yeah. turns. Yeah, so far from the great. And another one, the guiding light. Yep. And I remember like being a kid and you know, my first language. I look, I was born in I was born in Hoboken, New Jersey. Okay. So um, my dad was from Italy, my mother was Italian American, but my grandmother was my mom's mom was for don't ask it, she was Italian, she lived with us. And as a child, you know, there was no daycare, preschool, the families always watched the kids. So mm -hmm. I remember going into preschool um, and I, I understood English, but because I was conversing all the time with my grandmother, I, I mean, I was speaking Italian or, I mean, I mean, I know like in Spanish you have Spanglish. So it's the Italian version of what Spanglish is. And Italianish? Italianish, yes. And it was really <laughs> interesting because it was interesting because like, I remember the kids like, either making fun of me or like not understanding but like but I was born here and you know yeah. and, and so yeah. so how was your transition I mean like how did you like obviously you did all your education in grammar school and high school and middle school and stuff in Miami yeah actually um th that's so funny because that actually brought up a uh, brought up uh, uh, an experience for me when I was in first grade at uh Lakeview Elementary 
um, I was speaking to another Spanish speaking kid in line and we were talking about something mundane like, you know, do you want chocolate milk or regular milk? I like chocolate milk because it tastes great. You know, like one of those silly conversations you have in the first grade. And the teacher came by and she said, it's not polite to speak in another language in front of people that don't understand. And absolutely. But I didn't know I was speaking a foreign language. Mm -hmm. As far as I knew, <laughs> that was how you, you I, I, and it was in that moment that I realized, oh, you can say things two different ways. Like it just came out, whatever came out. You know, I never like went, this is Spanish or this is English. It was just, it, and then and then I realized, oh, yeah, that's right. It's chocolate and it's chocolate. Like I was just like, <laughs> it just never occurred to me until that teacher said that to me. So it was one of those, one of those strange eye-opening experiences that you never forget because I never forget her saying, it is not polite, to, you know, mm -hmm. wow. foreign language. It well, was the best part. The best part is like, um, obviously, you know, I, I, I grew up in Little Havana, Union City. I went to Holy Rosary Academy and Holy Rosary Academy High School. And it was like the Italians, um, a couple of like, like white people. And don't say what I'm going to tell you what I mean by that. And then there was Cubans. And because I was ethnic and the Cubans were ethnic and we knew a different language, we always thought that we weren't white. For the longest time, you know, mm -hmm. someone would say, like, even in young, if you're filling out those SAT, not SAT, those stupid forms, and they go like, or ask you, what's your nationality? I would never say Caucasian, I would say Italian. Mm -hmm. And because it was so, it was, it's an ethnic thing. It's a, it's a feeling of like, I belong to a certain, I don't, not that I'm not white, of course I'm white, but it never really dawned on me that it was white, Italian, you know, Cuban, it was it was weird because it was segmented and i never felt that i fit in because the white girls were like the burnouts you know what i mean i don't do that, you know? <laughs> I don't do they that. Were burnouts at your school too yeah uh, um yeah. uh no it's interesting that you would say that because i wrote a show so i wrote a, a one woman show about growing up cuban and queer in miami called viva la evolution i was very lucky it was my first show by my my then girlfriend who's now my wife directed it and you know, that was a real testament. Like if we could survive doing that show, you know, we were meant to be together. And um, uh, it was a great experience. We, 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 we won the New York Fringe Festival. It was, it, was, it was just this crazy, crazy, wonderful thing. My second show, I tried to write a show about growing up called, uh, wait a minute, I thought I was white. And I want to explain that to you because I grew up in a bubble where they're basically everybody else was Cuban American as well. Our neighborhood, our, our schools, the, you know, I went to St. James. Uh, so I also went to Catholic school. I also went to public school for a while. And um, I was always in this bubble and I would watch TV and see D the Donnie and Marie show and think, uh, oh yeah, they're Cuban. They look like Cuban, <laughs> you know? They're just being polite and speaking in English because not everybody speaks Spanish. So, you know, I figured when you turned off the TV set, they were like, oh, okay, Mari, ¿qué tú quieres comer hoy? You know, and then, I don't mean, no, yo quiero café con leche. You know, I, I didn't think that they were, um, I, I honestly thought they were Cuban. I thought everybody was Cuban. I thought the Flintstones were Cuban. I, I had no, I, I just didn't separate. I just thought, in front of people, you speak English, and at home, you speak Spanish. You know, of so, course the Flintstones were Cuban. You had Vilma, Vilma, <laughs> yeah, Vilma and then, you know, <laughs> like you. you know, it was just—it sounded Cuban. You know, he always had a big temper and a loud mouth. Sounded Cuban. You know, so, uh, so yeah, so it was, uh, it was, uh, so I had the kind of the opposite where when I moved to, so I, I also lived in Europe for a while and and briefly in New York, and then I moved to LA and I was in a comedy troupe called the Gay Mafia, which was a great experience as well. Uh, wonderful, wonderful, talented people I worked with. And I was in this sketch called um, Gay Mariachi. And um, the guy who wrote it said to me, well, you're gonna have to play my mom because you're the only other brown person in the troupe. And I said, brown? <laughs> <laughs> me, I'm brown? And he said, yeah, brown, brown, Hispanic, brown, brown, Latino. 
And I was like, what? I just, it, it, honestly, I was so naive. And uh, it was, it was really then that I started grasping, oh yeah, wait a minute. What does color mean? You know, mm -hmm. what does it mean? I tried to write a show about it. It really is so complicated. It's impossible to explain, but I think that, uh, I think, and I dropped that show and like, yeah, this is not working out too hard. <laughs> but uh, but I, I, I thought about, I, I, I think about it now because now I really do think of myself as a color. I very much identify with uh, being Latino, being the first generation American. And I think that, um, you know, it's interesting discovering it later in life because then you go, oh, wait a minute, I have this whole other identity mm -hmm. that is also me. So, you know, I, I I go back and forth between the two worlds, you know, very easily. No, I loved growing up, like, because, I, I mean, I learned Spanish. I, I was, you know, I chose Spanish. I know, you, you spoke Spanish. Spanish to me. I was like, what the hell? She's Cuban. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then, but it's so funny, because I was like, oh, I didn't think of it as another language. I thought, oh, it's code. <laughs> it's code now. So me and my friends can speak in front of my parents and their parents and have a whole other language. But it also kind of was, I mean, I think, like, you know, because you're, when you're in that high school age, it's inclusion. There's inclusion, exclusion. You want to, you know, and, you know, and everybody in that, especially in that, maybe my generation, I don't know, I hope it doesn't happen, but there's bullying and whatnot. So it was kind of like, you know, you, you know the, the Cuban girls, them, they would sit there and go T -t 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 in Spanish. So I'm like, what are they talking about? They're talking about me? You know, like total Jersey Italian. They're talking about me? I wonder what they're <laughs> talking about. And so I, you know, and so after a while, you know, you, when you, when I learned it and I spoke to it, it was very interesting because then I was assimilated into it. So instead of being talked about, I was part of the, you know, the in-group and it, because the Cubans were the in-group because it was the majority. And, um, and it was really interesting just as you grow up, because I mean, there are things that happened to me and I'm sure all of you in school that, you know, who thought of it as bullying? You know, we didn't. You know, if we went to our parents, oh, such and such is doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, apologize or don't do that again. But, you know, un you know, I think we, our generation, Mari, a little younger than the rest of us, but I think our generation really because of maybe our parents, you know, were, you know, not uh, born here or whatever. It's sort of our generation kind of went like have battle scars. Mm -hmm. And I think we're a testament that, you know, there doesn't have to be any, you know, name calling, labeling, you know, and I'm glad that our generation sort of went through the battle scars. So the next generation sort of we pass on and support the next generation who, you know, people our age who, you know, who, whether they're gay, straight or whatever, have children, they're sort of, you know, pushing that forward, not to have us go through what we went through, that it really is all one. We're all one. We all want. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but don't you think that, don't you think bullying is like, I mean, I don't know if it's a rite of passage or what have you, but whether it's your nationality or whether it's your size or whether it's your hair color or freckles or whatever, bullying is just, you know, seemingly what kids do. And maybe it's, you know, and ultimately it always comes down from your own inherited experience. So, you know, I, I, I would like to think that maybe uh, pointing bullying out in its various different forms, whether it's your nationality or, you know, whether you're a gay kid or, you know, a big kid or what have you, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just, you know, it used to be suck it up, kid, just take it. You can, you can do that. And I think now people are realizing, no, that's, that's not the proper behavior, but I don't know that, I don't know. I, th I think it's just, I don't know if it's, it's kids just do it naturally. It, I don't know what what is spiritually Cheryl maybe you can give us a, a hint <laughs> of what is that in our nature it's to be bullies and, that, you know mean? identity development right it's about them developing their personality but I do agree a lot of it comes is passed down from parents you know and and it is a power thing it's almost about developing that ego I feel but I, I think a lot of it nowadays you know everyone is so sensitive right now because we're all we're all opening up. And it's a yeah. beautiful thing, really. It's it's a beautiful awakening that even these young people have. They're so smart. These young people are so smart coming up now. So I have no doubt that, you know, bullying is going to, you know, you know, make many transformations still. But mm -hmm. yeah, me growing up, when I was growing up, I got picked on, but it wasn't really called bullying. Like you guys said, I think, uh, Gayanne, you mentioned it was just part of it. Like 
uh, yeah, just get on with it. Or, you know, uh, when they pick on you, it's just part of the, part of the school, part of the education. So yeah. what do you guys think? Is that, is that human nature? Is that, is it learned? Is it nature? What is it? Why? It's not in my, it's not in my human nature. I've never been that type. I've always been the type that gets bullied and has to stand up for myself. Um, so I don't find it in my human nature, but it is, it's probably, I mean, it's in people's personalities. Um, well, where does that come from? It's sort of like, I, I, I relate it all to cat. I, I relate it all to cats. <laughs> you know, um, everything relates to cats. And you know, the music how, I hope. I was going to say, <laughs> <laughs> but you know how I, I think the nature part is the, is the, I would think the, uh, and this is a hypothesis, of course, is the natural urge to dominate, to feel safe, to feel confident by dominating. But when it goes to another extreme, because I think a little bit of do dominating, as, as, as Jenny said, it is a rite of passage. I think it was Jenny that said it, maybe mm, yes. it was you, Gayan, but it yes. is a, it's a, a bit of rite of passage uh, and but then it goes to another extreme and really today especially with the ability to be anonymous online and in social yeah. media so true it's it, it's Perfect. like this poison it's a poison that when ingested one wants more and more and more and more and it's really really um i think that's when we really have to call it out and say okay no this is this borders on criminal you know Absolutely. Uh, you know, and I think it's that an anonymity that, that makes it makes it that way. I'm yes. so glad I didn't grow up in uh, times of internet because, I mean, there's just so many things you could do as bullies now online that you couldn't do, you know. I mean, but I even hate teasing. I mean, teasing, like, you know, when people sort of, they demystify or they, when they say, oh, I'm not bullying, I'm teasing. It's the same yeah. freaking thing, yeah. you know? It's the same freaking thing. I mean, and especially if like you tell people, I don't want to be teased. I don't like to be teased because, you know, maybe it's a trigger from my past and they continue to do it. It's like, seriously, if I am specifically asking you not to do it and you continue to do it and you're the only one laughing in the room, <laughs> there's a problem. <laughs> That's bullying, you know? It's just like, you know, I mean, not that I'm going to transition to rape, but you know, it's like if you have sex, I'll because it is the same kind of thing. It's like if you have sex with someone, even if you consent mutually in the beginning, at any point, if you say stop and that person continues, that's a rape. So going back, if if you're if someone's doing something that you don't like and you expressly state, I don't like it, and they doing they're doing it, then it's whatever that crime is, but. <clears throat> I know that was a weird transition, but, <laughs> but then, you know okay. my mind always works in mysterious ways. I'm with Mara though, man. Can you imagine yeah. all the melodramatic premenstrual 14 year old shit I said? I'm like, ooh, really glad they didn't have Facebook back then. <laughs> exactly. No, I mean, but I mean, I, I guess, and I, I don't know. I mean, I was bullied for a while. I mean, I bullied, I was teased, bullied for a lot of things. I mean, my height was one. God knows they went to town on my name. I mean, you know, yeah, right. gay, are you gay? And it was never from my kid. It was from my people, my counterparts. It was from their older brothers. You know, you gay, are you gay? I'm like, yeah. Not really understanding what <laughs> gay meant. Yeah, I'm gay. Of course I'm gay. And then them having a just a riot a minute about it, laughing. I'm like, why are they laughing? I mean, I am gay, you know? <laughs> It's like that, you know, Robin Turner, the activist, she's uh -huh. like, the, one of the jokes she did way back in the seventies is like, the guy would say to her, hey, are you a lesbian? And she's like, are you the alternative? <laughs> <laughs> Very funny. Yeah, I once got asked in Catholic school, I think I was in the seventh grade, sixth or seventh grade, they were talking about virgins. And I was like, and I was like, what? And, and I go, I'm not a virgin. Cause I was thinking Virgin Mary. Like I was thinking that, <laughs> that meant you were special and you were gonna have a child, you know? So I went, I'm not a virgin. And I remember the kid turning at me going, you're not a virgin. <laughs> and, and it like, it kind of went from there all across the whole thing. I was like 
you know, seven, sixth, seventh grade. Ooh, and uh, and I was like, no, I'm not the Virgin Mary. I'm not like the Virgin Mary, you know? And they, I thought they meant without sin is what I thought. So anyway, big mess. And of uh -oh. course, <laughs> 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 four. <laughs> four. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't have good memories about that. But I, I, I think, you know, interestingly, uh, I, I think you're right. I think it does get passed down. Um, uh, and a lot of it is kind of borderline personality disorder things that <laughs> parents have their issues, and then they take it out on their kids, and then their kids think that's reality, and then they just perpetuate it. Yeah. And I think some of it is just natural, what your, your personality, your, your spirit, your soul, part of it is just in you. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, granted all through that time, I mean, you know, we're sort of all finding our oats and trying to figure things out. So it is a game of survival. You know, it really is a game of survival um, to sort of, and even find who you are, you know, and, and, you know, I'm sure a lot of us throughout our whole lives, you know, we adapt to people, you know, we don't adapt to people, we pull away. <laughs> Really, it's, I think for me, I have a hard time. I'm usually like a people pleaser and I want everyone to like me. So, you know, I'll adapt to things even if, I mean, it's not, even if it's like, I look and go, well, if it's not that big a deal, okay. But as I've gotten older now, it's like, no, this doesn't work for me. You know, this absolutely doesn't work for me. And if someone's toxic in my life, whether it's a friend or a relationship, it's a lot easier now to sort of step away from it because it's all about self-love, self-care. It's all about self. We're growing up, <clears throat> you know, it's like you never really thought about self. It was Oh yeah. Old. That's a silver lining of getting older. Is you don't take <laughs> any bullshit anymore. You know? Uh -huh. Like that is definitely it. Because there's a lot of things, and I know we all can agree about getting older is not so much fun. <laughs> but uh yeah, not a lot of fun. But the silver lining is I don't have to take anybody's shit anymore. I know who I am. I know what's right. I know what, what you mean too about saying, no, I, I don't agree with that. I'm not comfortable with it and I don't need it in my life. So I, I think that is definitely kind of worth a lot. So when you get here, that's a great thing to, that is the best part about it. Definitely a big bonus. It's like the best line of, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, I can't think of the movie now. Oh, Fried Green Tomatoes, where she, she smashes into the girl's car and she's like, I'm older and I have more insurance. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. Hilarious. So, Deanna, how did you get on your path? How did you know you wanted to get into this, this line of work? I mean, because in Miami, I mean, Miami's not known to be like the entertainment capital. So how did you discover your talents and, and what, you know, and were your parents supportive? Uh, no, they weren't supportive. They didn't mean to be, uh, unsupportive. They just were scared. You know, I, I said, I was a very creative child and, um, my, my mom has apologized to me. She said, you know, when you were, you know, grabbing the glue and cutting things and putting tape and things together and all that stuff. And I kept thinking you were just making a mess. <laughs> I hid hiding things. She goes, I didn't realize you were an artist, you know, like <laughs> it never occurred to her that maybe I had a spark of creativity, <laughs> but at least she realizes that now, which is just, which is really nice. Were um, your parents not creative? You didn't, you don't come from that kind of, of a background? And no, I think uh, they may have been, but it was all kind of destroyed by the Cuban revolution because, you know, they were teenagers during that time and they had this really, I mean, I don't want to go into a big history lesson, but there's this really awful authoritarian dictator, Batista, who strangely, if you line up the things that he likes to like to do, match a certain someone in our lives right now, mm -hmm. um, they were young and they thought, okay, we're gonna we're gonna change the world, we're gonna make it a lot better. And they brought into power Fidel Castro. And Fidel Castro basically ripped their country apart, ripped, ripped it from them, ripped it away from them. So their trauma was, we've got to survive this. They literally, my mother knew, uh, the neighbor's uh, daughter had been dating someone in the government. So she saw soldiers pull up to the house next door 
and drag this 16, 17 year old girl out of the house never to be seen again. So oh. my parents were concerned about surviving. Yeah, that doesn't so, leave room for creativity and, and free spirit. Yeah, no. yeah. So no. when they came to this country, it was about getting an education, getting a job, and putting steak in front of us at almost every single night for dinner. Like they were like successful because their kids were going to school and they could put steak in front of us. And you know, it, it's, it's an interesting thing. So what they wanted most of all was security. And so when I said, I wanna be an artist, I wanna be an actor or a writer or a director or a painter or, you know, everything creative, um, they were scared. And so they, really tried to discourage me. And um, lucky for me, and it's strange how destiny works out. I was in community college because I couldn't decide what I wanted to do. I wanted, I wanted to go to film school. My parents wanted me to become an accountant. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, they, I took a class in German because it was important to have, uh, at the time, there was like, learn a foreign language, another foreign language. It'll always help you. So I picked German because it was the opposite of Cuban. Like that was my <laughs> whole thing was I wanted the opposite of what I was in because I felt so trapped. And um, the German teacher there, who when I think back on it, I think maybe she was a lesbian and maybe she saw, she saw a little connection there. And she told me that there was a scholarship that if you, that it, that it was available that you could go to Germany for, for a year and study and also do an internship. And she said, and this was the part that kept echoing in my mind, and you can study anything you want, anything you want, anything you want, <laughs> anything you want. And so I went for it. And at the time I had always been a ticket, I had always been a photographer, I always had cameras. And um, I submitted my portfolio and the portfolio led to me uh, applying for this scholarship and I got the scholarship. And I was able to go to Berlin. And um, in Berlin, I was put with an exchange family. It was, if you were to put the picture of my exchange family and my, my real family, it was like, this was the German version of my Cuban family. <laughs> like, it was incredible, the resemblance. And they, later on, I found out that they had had a child that would have been my age that died as a baby. Oh. So for oh. them, I was filling a certain hole and for me, they gave me art and appreciation of theater. And um, they were just, you know, my parents, they didn't do those things. All they wanted to do was survive and make sure their kids were okay. Mm -hmm. These, this family was um, kind of what I needed at the exact right time when I needed it. So I spent two years in Germany. I learned to speak German fluently. I became a DJ. I started, I started working in the film industry and uh, it changed my life forever, you know? And, uh, and when I came back and my parents saw that I could speak German and that I had these skills, they, they've slowly come around to it. And they know that I have a show called Latina Christmas Special, but I'm gonna tell you something. I think they're afraid to see it because they know. <laughs> And it's true. All of my comedy and all of my uh, all of my stories have to do with personal experience. So they know that they're in it. Uh, they're, yeah. they, they're scared. They're so scared to see what what I what I talk about. But the funny thing is, is that yes, there's some fun in it. You know, I'm telling. You know, what makes people human is their 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 charms, their flaws. But in the end, they've always been the heroes. So I, it's it's funny that they are so afraid to see what it is. But in reality, you know, they're the heroes. They really did do a very brave thing, and everything I have is the result of them, you know, taking that chance and coming. Do, to do they know that? Did you tell them? I'm sure you told them that, right? Oh, yeah, I I, I I have, but they're still terrified. <laughs> <laughs> You know, one of these days. I mean, I imagine, I always imagine that my mom is going through the internet going, Diana, you know, like looking up <laughs> and probably has seen my jokes about butts and things. And, you know, uh, but I, I don't know. I don't know. They, they're, as I said, they've, they've been through a big trauma. So I don't blame them. 
and I and I love them anyway. Are you, you still in touch? Big family? I'm sorry. Go ahead, Cheryl. I was just going to say, are you still in touch with your Berlin family? I am. I am, and I still speak with them. Uh, and, and even though uh, it's you know I haven't been in Germany, I, I did go back for a visit with my wife. Uh, I don't know, maybe seven or eight years ago to see them. But it's it's really far away, and there's not like there are a lot of Germans walking around. All of them speak perfect English anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but it really stuck with me. Your brain is most open to foreign languages between four. I'm sorry, five and seven, and between 19 and 21. And I lived there from 19 to 21, so I still speak German. It definitely suffers though it's when it's useless. A long time. Huh? What? It's useless. Honestly, well, and well, because so many Germans speak English, but but my my German parents they don't speak English well, so I I enjoy talking to them. Yeah, they're only speak sorry. fabulous English. Germans speak fabulous English. So do Greek. Oh yeah, they're really good. I oh, mean, good. shockingly good. Yeah. yeah. And when she said she just mentioned that casually that she was a DJ there, Diana has is an amazing DJ. She has really really good musical. <laughs> taste and can uh oh shit i wish i wish i had the energy to stay out all night and be a dj <laughs> <laughs> you did back in the day i bet you pulled a lot of all-nighters oh yeah no there was a it was in the uh it was the 80s and um you know i i one of the clubs i dj'd at um we it was had a, a two-story dragon that i had to take it ladder to get on top of and then there was like three turntables and I was very young 19 20 years old you know they don't have a drinking age limit there and so I you know they love to hear me speak German with my Cuban American accent <laughs> so I said, yeah we're dancing to Michael Jackson and they would be like ah, they loved it yeah. you know and then one time I had I had too much to drink there's three turntables I forgot which one was on so I lift up the needle Everybody's dancing. The whole club is full of people dancing. I lift up the needle and all of the music stops. All of the music. Everybody stops. And I go, oh my God. I drop the needle. The needle goes boom, boom, boom. And then the song continues and everybody goes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did it on purpose. I was like, all right. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I just, I mean, I, like I said, I, I love Diana because we have such parallel. I mean, literally we have such parallel lives. I'm like the Italian version of the Cuban version. I um, except I, you know, I went, I went abroad for, I lived in um, London for right. a, year, a year and a half. Um, and it's because I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to go to Spain and I didn't want to go to Italy. And I wanted to, I knew I wanted a party, but I also knew I had to go to school. So I'm thinking, shit. If I have to learn something in a foreign language, I'm going to totally screw up. So I picked England because it was pretty easy. I mean, I, I understood what the hell they were saying. But, you know, that, that was the 80s, too. And I did not DJ. I DJed later when I moved to California. But I was a bartender. I had no idea what I was doing. But I was the novelty of the American bartender who probably shouldn't have been working because I didn't have a green card or anything. So I would get paid all in cash and stuff. But shit, we're talking like Coyote Ugly bartender, dancing <laughs> on the bars and shit. Where um, was that then? What? Where was it? Um, okay. Um, oh shit, Ma not Maxwell. Was it Maxwell's? It was that great, Pickin. ladies and gentlemen. But it, uh, it was in Piccadilly. It's not there anymore. It was a tiny little bar, and it was it was a bar because obviously it couldn't go somewhere like legitimate because then you know you, people, i'm sure they want me to pay taxes and shit so it was this tiny little bar and and i was young i mean i was like young and thinner and drunk so you know i mean <laughs> young thinner and drunk it is amazing how almost like the universe takes care of you during that time because you know just like that dropping the needle thing i did so many things that you know truly Truly, when you think think and thinking about it now, if I was looking at my daughter, I'd be terrified. <laughs> the, the sort of things I did, you know, the chances of people I met that I went out with, you know, without even knowing anything about them and all that stuff. But mm -hmm. something about that time in your life, it was a something it, about it was the eighties. The eighties, maybe, 80s yeah. were amazing. I mean, I remember even before I went to to Europe. I mean, I I started, and everyone knows this story. I was like going to clubs since I was thirteen years old in the city. 
And we used to walk and talk and people would say, you meet somebody, you know, you, you, you oh, we're going to the next club. Let's share a cab. I mean, you're not thinking murderer, rapist, you know, you're not, you're just like, okay, let's do it. And, you know, and of course I never told my parents that I was doing this. I was always at my friend's house over a sleepover. But when you think about your past, and I'm sure all of us have had some sort of past where you said when we were youthful and going, God, you know, it could have been a really ugly thing that the ugly things that could have happened. But I think for some reason, <clears throat> I think the eighties were cool. <laughs> I think one of the cool. saddest things about the 21st century is that hitchhiking will never happen again. And that was such fun. Did anybody hitchhike? Cause it really was a fun thing to do. No, I thought that was, that was dangerous as shit. <laughs> I never really hitchhiked. To being able to, to have enjoyed it. <laughs> I've never done it. I picked up one hitchhiker and it was, I was in Ann Arbor. I was going to school there at the time. And there was a woman and she was, I don't know, maybe in her thirties or so. And she was on the side of the road. I'm like, I was like just on the edge of campus. And I'm like, all right, I can give her a ride. And so she, I pulled over and she's like, do you mind if I bring my son? I've got my son here who was like a 18, 19 year old. And like you were saying, gay Ann, you're like, oh, I don't want to say no and disappoint. So yes, I said, yeah, but I'm like, okay, I should have said no, because why did you hide him other than I probably <laughs> wouldn't have stopped had it been she and him. So and I, no, never doing it again. Never, never done it personally. No, yeah. I mean, like I said, for doing a lot of shit when I was younger, like that freaked me out. I, I don't know why. It could have been those after school specials. I don't yeah, know. That was it. <clears throat> you know, those after school, ABC after school specials. But I mean, but even going to concerts, and they used to like pass around the pot. I mean, these are people you don't know, you know, and they're passing around the joint down the thing and you're just taking a hit. And it's like, now it, it, it revolts me to even think I did that. It's like, oh my God, that was so disgusting. Who the fuck were these people? Like it was their spit, you know, shit like that. <laughs> but you know, but I figured it had to build up my immune system. So you know, either way. COVID has really, Fracked up passing joints around. I'm just gonna say. <laughs> yes. COVID has fucked up a lot, but you know, <laughs> fucked up a lot. It screwed up my social life completely. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I go on dating sites and it's like, I mean, I'm on every single one of them. Hinge. Well, you know all of them. I mean, I know I know all of them, but I'm on it and it's like. Now it's become a sport. Like before you'd go to a club or you'd go to a friend's house or you, and you'd see these women and go, nah, 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 or yeah, 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 yeah. Now, now it's like a sport. It's like, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes. For at least half an hour to go through all of them. And, you know, and I'm thinking, and I don't even pay. So that's what even makes it more of a sport is I don't care if they're responding to me. It's like, nope, nope, nope. And then the ones that I, then the ones that come up as a match are people that I know. And I didn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even date them like in real life. Forget about like asking them to date on a freaking dating app, you know, weird, weird. I don't know how you guys are dating. I don't, I wouldn't be able to date right now. I'm not dating in the COVID times. Um, I know a lot of people that go out on dates and um, they just use the masks and whatever, but I, I can't. I, oh, it's I, scary. I totally agree with you, Mara, but I got to say the way you said that was hilarious. The COVID times. <laughs> I just don't know about the COVID times. <laughs> it brought up the COVID times, yes. The COVID era. I'm still it's impressed true. that Kara did hitchhiking. That's still, <laughs> I'm still, I'm still yeah, there. Baby. I'm still like, Kara is wow. the most craziest woman ever. So. Ever, ever, Ooh. ever, ever. Kara. Well, I lived in LA Cara. in the in, this, in 1974. I was 17 or 18 or 19 when I was young um and um and I oh, was come on uh, seven eight come on <laughs> <laughs> and um and there were the the buses were not running for some reason whatever you, you I, I had to hitch down Kirkwood and get to my job which was in a radio uh, um, uh, recording studio and so I, I I hitched every day and almost oh almost every time it was absolutely fine there was one guy leaned over and grabbed my tip it was like Stop the car, please. <laughs> so none of the none of the scenes from uh, what's the name of that movie? Once upon a time in Hollywood. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, just making sure. Right. Well, yes, a little like that. I mean, it was like that then. Uh -huh. That's what I yeah. Mean. No, I actually kind of vaguely 
vaguely remember that, but I, 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 I never took that chance. I mean, I'm telling you, my mom filled me with all sorts of horror stories of things that happen to little girls that trust, right. that trust people, that trust anyone, even the doctor, you know? So. I mean, my parents did so too, but I was, I was always out to prove them wrong. I always like tested, I mean, not that I did anything bad, but it's like, if my mother said, don't do that. I, I was always the kid that did it. And I went, see, I told you. And then I got in trouble for doing it to start with. I'm like, but it's not about that I did it. Look, the outcome wasn't what you predicted. I was always guess born to be a lawyer. Um, but I, you know, Cheryl's been awfully quiet. And well, I was gonna say, I was, I was the one that had the car you know, uh, at a young age. So I didn't pick up hitchhikers, but I took everyone, all my friends, wherever they wanted to go. So, I mean, I was the one doing all the driving, I guess, back then, but I, I would not pick up a hitchhiker just to let you know. I, I would shy <laughs> away from that. Things are different now. Yeah, things, times yeah. are different. Yeah. No, I, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not like scared of things now, but what I took chances on back in the day I wouldn't take chances on that because it's a different world. It's a different place. I mean, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of odd people now. And maybe they were odd then, but we didn't have the media. And we didn't have the social media and we didn't have all of this other stuff that sort of brought to light things. Cause I mean, like, you know what, you know, if someone died or someone got killed, you'd watch it on the evening news, maybe twice. It would be on maybe the morning news, evening news, afternoon news or when you read the paper and you read it. But other than that, we were all in a bubble. There was, a, I'm sure, a lot more crap going on that we had no clue that if we did, we'd probably have more wherewithal not to have done what we have done. But- Part of it is also youth, I think. You're just, you know, you're just only aware of what you, what, what means anything to you. And that might be that, you know, Biffy bought some new jeans or, or something like that <laughs> as opposed to, as opposed to, you know, what's, re what's really happening out there. That's why I'm actually kind of, my brother said something the other day, and by the way, my brother was a rebel. He's the one who did everything that he wasn't supposed to do. I waited till I was in my twenties and then I went wild. But uh, my, uh, my brother was pointing out, he was talking about, he teaches school at a, um, uh, at a, uh, a, a, a medical school. He's a physical therapist and he teaches physical therapy. And he was telling me about how he's really scared for the world, some of his students that are in his class, some of the stuff that they did. He gave me a great example. He said, I asked the kid, I told the kid in the test, they asked, they tell him a physical thing. They said, you, you're you dealing with an amputee and they're having uh, this sort of pain. So what would you do to alleviate this amputee's pain, a below the knee pain? And the, the kid goes, uh, well, I would uh, stretch the uh, calves and, uh, and uh, 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 you know, uh, manipulate the ankle, something like that. And my brother goes, listen to my question. <laughs> An amputee below the knee is complaining of pain. What would you do? And the, the kid thinks about it and goes, I would stretch the calf <laughs> and manipulate the foot. And my brother was like, I can't send these, you know, I'm scared for the world for these, for these people. But then we got on the topic of millennials and, you know, there's something to be said for them. They're out there, they're voting, they're making a difference. And, um, you know, I have a lot of respect for them. We have to just remember, and when we, when we were their age, we also, had a lot of distractions. For me, it was Duran Duran, but uh, you know, <laughs> you know. for me, it was Bon Jovi and Guns N' Roses. Yeah, yeah, I was Duran Duran, the police. Yeah, uh, yes. I was, I was a little darker. I was Susie and the Banshees, um, The Cure. Yeah, yeah, I, I yeah. Was my brother liked those too. You, you and my brother, we get along. <laughs> it's always been Cher for me. <laughs> okay. Who said that? Jenny? Yeah. Yes, I need to take care, fan, don't you know? That's oh, good. Good. It actually was about. good. Let's not beat up Cher. Cher Cher's oh. a good Oh, girl. no way. Cher was the coolest. Woman. Cher was no one cool. beating up Cher. She's, she doesn't age. You she can't beat up Cher. Cher's the boss <laughs> of the world. Right there. You have to, wait, what where's Cher? Hell? Hello. Donald Trump is an asshole. Burr. 
<laughs> hey, her face is pretty good. Let me see That's that. Very yeah. good. It's pretty good. You know what? Uh, she's missing a couple of shoes, um, and one set of eyelashes, and I don't know how that stain got there on her dress. But other than that, she's been there a lot. We've been through a lot, haven't we, Cher? Yeah. Can we oh, see that face? Had that. Can we see a little face? Yeah, her hair is in the way. It's pretty good. I was just hearing about the yeah, show. Yeah, it does look like her, her nose is Oh, my goodness. Yeah. You know, she's yeah. only got one eyelash. Only yeah. one set of eyelashes, though. Oh. That looks like a that looks like a one night stand. Yeah, uh, exactly. Walk of shame. Yeah, Sorry, exactly. But... <laughs> How long? Oh, have you been Cher, there? they didn't mean it. They didn't mean it, Cher. <laughs> no, the new Cher doll and walk of shame outfit. <laughs> <laughs> what other dolls do you have, Jenny? <laughs> well, <laughs> I've got. Oh, oh you like froggy. You like froggy. Hang on, because we're using green screens. Froggy's not really there. <laughs> it's, there's his hands and his face, but the rest of him's green, so you don't see him. <laughs> um, who was your favorite angel on Charlie's Angels? Um, Are you me? asking the lesbians or, or the straight women? Everybody, because they weren't lesbians. I, I'm all inclusive, honey. Everybody. <laughs> okay. Sarah, everybody well, angel. Chris and Jill Monroe for me, just saying. Um, Jacqueline Smith. I would have to say Jacqueline Smith. Yeah. That's yeah. a hard Farrah one. Farrah Fawcett one, too. Yeah, Farrah yeah, Fawcett Farrah was Chris. Was yeah. And then Cheryl Ladd was Jill. No. Yeah, Jill and Chris, I don't remember. No, Farrah, Jill Fawcett was, and... Farrah Fawcett was Jill. And, Jill. and then Chris was Diane, Diana... Diana Ladd? Diane. No, Cheryl Ladd. Oh, Cheryl Ladd. Cheryl Ladd, yes. Ladd. For well, me, I, it's, I, loved, I loved Kate Jackson. I loved the, the yeah. smart one. Sabrina. All right. Oh, really? Well, I've worked with every single one. Um, every single one. Even Tawny, Tawny Roberts. Was that her name? The last the last Brown? OK, well, don't tell Cheryl me. Cheryl Hack should be discluded. Well. I'm sorry. We can't, we can't talk about Cheryl Shelley Hack. Hack, yeah. yeah she had Shelley Hack. Hack. See? Yeah, Shelley Hack. Yeah, but um, the, they all were very lovely. Oh, oh good. I thought you were gonna say they're crazy as shit. No, well, yeah, there's one, of them, one, one of them actually was crazy as shit. Um, but <laughs> but she did what I needed her to do for, photographically. But she was very difficult. Um, I bet you that was Sabrina. <laughs> what was that one? Kate Jackson. Kate. Yeah, Kate Jackson right. was Sabrina. Ding, I know, ding, because ding, strangely, right. I had a crush on her as a child, but as an adult, I know she's batshit crazy. So yeah. Yeah, she. But I mean, she, like she was fine, but it's true. I mean, she, you think she's watching? Think not. Um, but but Jacqueline she Smith. Call me. Call <laughs> we said hi. Um, and uh, but no, Jacqueline Smith was probably the I thought the nicest. And then Farrah Fawcett I worked with, and I have to say I did her last um, TV thing before she passed. Yeah. And um, it's unfortunate because she was just she was so sweet and so fragile, and mm -hmm. such a tortured soul. Um, and yeah. it was really sad. It was just really, really, really sad. But she mm -hmm. was sweet, and it was shocking that she passed. It was just weird. Yeah. But right uh, after that, yeah. And right. she died on the same day as Michael Jackson, so it's kind of like she never really got her big fanfare. I'm not or even no. dead. Ever. It was like, and then print. Well, how long? I didn't realize that. That's I didn't make that day because I think she died. Would she die first, or did yeah. Jackson? She died first, and then that made I the think. news. And then I think Jackson died, and then people were like, Farrah who? So, yeah. I have her birthday. <laughs> you do? Yes, February 2nd. Oh. It's Christy Brinkley. I share with Christy Brinkley and Farrah Fawcett. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, a lot of beautiful people were born that day. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Mara's Angels. Mara's Angels. Oh, I oh. like it. I like it. Here we go. So, I mean, they redid the angels. I mean, who do they have again? Like Cameron Diaz. Oh, yes, Cameron Diaz. Drew Barrymore. Drew, Barrymore. And, and Lucy Liu. I like Drew Barrymore from that batch. Yes. Oh, I liked all of them, and I thought Bill Murray was a good Charlie, too. But yeah. yeah. He was funny. Always funny. I you told you that there was absolutely no linear anything to this show. <laughs> As we have just proven. <laughs> so... Considering oh, that there's not linear, let's put it back on track. What do you? What have you been doing during COVID? Have you been creative and artistic? Have you been? What have you been doing? I assume you're speaking to me because I got lost. Yes, 
Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, well, uh, it's been interesting. Uh, uh, if I may mention my wife Yay! again, Tell Mar Marjorie Duffield. She is. She's here. Actually, you want to say? You want to yeah, say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Show and tell. Show and tell. Oh no, she's fallen asleep. <laughs> oh well. Anyway, um, she really is dead asleep right now. I, she doesn't. She can't even hear me. Um, uh, she her, she wrote the lyrics to um, all uh, all the songs on the movie Over the Moon, so uh, which is on Netflix and it's been doing really well. It's a beautiful but, movie. I saw it the other day. Oh, oh, it's good. a beautiful it's a beautiful movie. Watch it. Yeah. It's a really heartwarming, feel good movie. Yeah, and and the songs are great wonderful, wonderful. too. I'm so glad that it wasn't because you know everybody has someone that's an artist in their life and you know sometimes they bring stuff in and you go. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, that's <laughs> nice. And you're and you're you're trying. You know, I don't have to do that. Thank God, the songs are really great. So, so anyway, re regarding COVID, we have been experiencing this. Our first big project that's done really well and is well funded, and we're hoping for really great things to come out of it. And we are stuck at home. So uh, what we've done is uh, we had a socially responsible, socially distant red carpet party at our friend's house. And they bought a step and repeat. And uh, Jenny was invited. She came in with a mask and she took off her mask for her red, red carpet photos. And uh, we screened the movie outside. And I have to say that in the end, when we, when we talked about all the wonderful people we had there that we love so much, we realized, wow, um, this, probably was better than any Netflix opening night shindig with executives and all that stuff because it was only people we loved mm -hmm. and it was just a really lovely experience. But it's been a lot of that, at least lately, because the, the movie was coming out and all that stuff. I have, um, I'm working on Latina Christmas special. We had all these bookings in New York and in LA and of course Aww. COVID, so no shows. Aww. So um, we're doing a two, we're doing two things. We're doing a special special, which will be hosted by your friend Sharon Gless um, uh, about uh, uh, where we're going to talk about the process of how we came up with the show and how how it all came together. And we're going to do that. I, I I don't have an exact date right now, but if you if you're interested, go to latinachristmasspecial.com and sign up for our newsletter because we're going to do a live show where we answer people's questions and all that stuff. And it'll be a great opportunity to celebrate Christmas and drink tequila and, and hear funny stories. And uh, I'm in that show with Sandra Valls, who I don't know if you know, and Maria Russell. That's, so that's that thing. And then I'm also producing an album because we filmed, we had a show in New York that was, was amazing. And I thought, I'm going to film the show because I have no archival footage of this. I'm gonna film the show. Um, I'm gonna pick a night that there's nobody there. It was like after Christmas, a Wednesday night. I call the theater, they say, oh, we've got 50 tickets sold. I go, oh, perfect. I'm gonna get a shitty camera, set up some mics, we'll just film the show, right? Two hours later, I get to the theater, we're sold out, we're oversold. Oh, wow. So it was like 175 seats were, 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 were sold out and there's no place to put the camera. We filmed it. It literally looks like the Beatles in Hamburg. It's like a <laughs> cave. And we're at the end, right? And you see everybody else. It's terrible. But I had these really great microphones. And that audio actually is now the basis. And I'm trying to, I'm working on producing an album, which will then go out nationally. One of our problems is we can't split ourselves up into you know, multiple people. We can't do the show in Chicago. There's only so much Christmas. <laughs> Thanksgiving to maybe the weekend in the first weekend in January, Three Kings Day. That's it. So we can't do Chicago, Miami, Texas. We, we got to pick our cities. So what I like about this idea is that then if you want to hear the audio of the show, which works as well, you just, you know, pop it in your <laughs> cassette deck, your eight oh, yeah. player, your CD. <laughs> Uh, on your way to grandma's house or that trip from Miami to Orlando to see your, you know, you see your, your, uh, your, your aunt and uncles and you do the Christmas thing because 
it's a really universal story. It's about what it is to be, to be American, to be, to ride the border between the culture of your parents and the culture of your country. And the understanding that in reality, to relate to one another, all we need is to have had parents. <laughs> so it really does apply to everyone. I've had Chinese American people come to the show, uh, Jewish American people come to the show and they go, wow, I had no idea. My family was so Latino. Because <laughs> it's not a Latino story. It's an American story. Oh. And so um, that's what, that's probably the, what I've been working on the most. That and, and drawing and taking pictures, but that's it. Well, I'm crazy about Christmas, right? And oh. since there's nothing much else to do, I'm putting my tree up next Thursday. And I Are you really? Oh, oh yeah. girl. Good for you. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I'm super excited about it. And, and, and to tell you the truth, I, I was working on the album and I was like, shit, I should have thought of this sooner. This really works. I mean, it's really great. And I don't have to worry about losing weight or putting on makeup or getting tighter <laughs> pants for it. It's great. Yeah. You know, yours sounds like such a breath of fresh air compared to the Hallmark movies I'm watching every night that are so cookie cutter, white bread, girl meets boy. I mean, they, they actually are putting black people in, there's one black person meets a white woman and they've actually- No, not yes. in Hallmark. I wow. was surprised. Wow, they, they really they, come to terms with what the, how going on in the world. Yes, but I'm waiting for the gay couples, um, which so far, I don't think that will ever happen. Um, well, don't say ever. It'll happen. Mark, yeah. Although I've been seeing a lot of cool commercials for gays, like uh, my friend forwarded me one. I think it was um, Nestle, maybe, that was a girl who brings her girlfriend to over for the holidays. Oh, I saw that. Oh, that, that was for Oreo. It was for uh, Oreo cookies. That's yeah. right. And the father is oh, yeah. extremely uncomfortable. You know, very that was beautiful. Mm -hmm. I wish that my situation had ended the way that commercial had, where the, the dad ends up, you know, getting on the bandwagon and he's Mr. Supportive, but it doesn't always work that way. And, and so for me, it kind of was like, I don't know, it just was sad. But I, I'm glad that they're doing positive commercials like that. Well, yeah. I was looking at yesterday, I between MSNBC and CNN, I thought, because I mean, they kept repeating the same thing and, and they're pretty much on our side. So I said, let me tune into Fox. Let's see what those jerks are. You are brave. And, you know, I have to say, because this was after when Nimrod spoke yesterday yeah. and talking about more bullshit and just retarded. And I know that's not politically correct, but please let it stand with this guy because he's every non-correctness. And the people on Fox were actually not on his bandwagon. They weren't saying he was wrong, but they weren't jumping on board as they always do, saying, oh, what wonderful speech. It was like they were in, a little embarrassed. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting. And then what caught my guard the next was there was a commercial on about some pet adoption. And then it was like, two lesbians, two gay men kissing. And I'm like, wait, Fox allowed this to be shown <laughs> on their network? What is going on? That's great. Yeah, but it was really interesting. I mean, I just hope, you know, I mean, I know Biden will do good or well or whatever. I might even speak in English anymore. Um, but I know that this country will rise again. And it really is so, I don't know, so wonderful right now to see that as the abs not absentee ballots and, and the written in ballots are coming in, <clears throat> that it is actually not what I thought that, as you said earlier in the show, Deanna, that there are people like us out there, you know, they are. And, you know, and it's going to show that as Biden becomes president, and he is. Um, I, have to, I have to say also in, in defense of, um, I don't know if it's really in defense of, but I feel like one thing that we all kind of have to come to realize, and this is them as well as us. Unfortunately, this toxic marriage between the two, two of us, you know, those of us on the 
left, those of us on the right, whether it's extreme or not, we're not able to say, okay, you move out, you get out of here, fucker, get out of here. They can't say that to us and we can't say that to them. So basically we're in this like Catholic marriage, we can't get divorced. Right? <laughs> and, and so we've got to find a way to somehow talk to some level where we can just kind of get out of each other's way. If this is the night that you get to use the kitchen, then use the kitchen. I'm going to stay in my room and watch TV. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like there has to be some sort of effort from both sides. And I want to say also that I'm going to say that there's a good, there's a percentage, a real shitty percentage, that are real asshole, racist, homophobes, anti-equality, anti-Semitic, dicks okay but then there's some people that have just been misled yeah and if we can just somehow let them see who we are it's one of the things i love about i love about being out is that meet me talk to me i'm not gonna sell you on gay i'm not gonna turn you <laughs> i'm not gonna turn you i'm not gonna sell you on it you don't have to buy into it but meet me yeah and then you judge for yourself you know yeah, hopefully Biden can bring a fresh, um, more loving presence to the universe. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, the he thing is, like Trump he'll be respectful. Yeah. Seems yeah, I mean, like the thing with Trump is he's he's all of the above himself, and he just, I guess, during his tenure, he just made it okay, you know, to to be that, mm -hmm. and where I think everybody sort of was trying to play oh, as much God. as they can in the playground. And he just flipped it going, no, if you, if you are this, this and that, and you don't, you want to hate, just do it. It's okay. I support you. And mm -hmm. I would hope that with when the Biden swing that we could still come back. We're going to agree to disagree on a lot of things, but maybe we can just come back to center where we can play in the same playground together. Yeah, uh, it's just a percentage. It's just, they're not gonna, it's not going to happen. They're just no. kind of gone. They're insane. And you can't talk to that. Been. But they've always been there and he let Pandora out of the box and they will continue to be there. But it's the others that, you know, I mean, look, we're all not, there's a certain segment that are just not good people, whether they're Republican or Democrat or right. aggressive. That's true. Extreme, extreme good um, yeah. people. Exactly. That's what I always tell my mother because my mother is always like the opposite of me is, is, you know, she'll always go for it. And it's, and this is what I tell her, extremes, fanaticism, whenever you have fanaticism or extremes, there's a problem there because that in order to, to be civilized, you have to, by definition, be balanced. Exactly. You know? So hopefully, you know, I pray and I'm not, I, I, I say pray, even though I'm not like I'm Catholic-ish. Um, <laughs> I'm Catholic-ish, but I do pray that, you know, when Biden and Kamala come into office that you know people after the first you know i guess speed bumps because people are, some people are going to be really pissed or whatever um that maybe once they get their head out of their ass that they can that we can all sort of work together you yeah. know and and strive for peace not about you know democrat republican you know let's screw this let's screw these the ladies over with roe versus wade and all that other shit let's just you know maybe try and work together you know, and I, I, I know that it seems to me that I think Democrats, when they're in charge, they have that mindset of, hey, let's try and work together. I do believe that. And maybe it's because I'm a Democrat and I see it. If I was Republican, I don't know. But I think that the Democrats do come in and sort of go, OK, you know, let's try and have a balance back. Because being too liberal, too, can be a little extreme as well. True. Extremism is a problem. Fanaticism yeah. is a problem. I, I think the cool thing is, like, we're seeing, like, Stacey Abrams, there is, cannot be enough said about that woman. If Georgia flips, and, and he may not need Georgia, it may get Pennsylvania and Arizona and Nevada and all the other things, but the fact that Georgia flipped, if it flips, and the fact that Texas came this close to flipping, and it was all with the metropolitan areas of people that are working together, people that are learning how to do this, you know, 
in in a collective way. We're all different people. I mean, it's as again with sports for me, it's like whenever if it's a team I don't really care, and the, you know the Falcons are playing, I'm like yeah, but it's a bunch of people down in Georgia. But now I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna be for the Falcons because those people in Georgia, those Atlanta Falcons fans, they helped you know push us over the edge. And I, it, but those are the kind of like things that I think we need to look at is like where you get bigger metropolitan areas, which are, you know, um, I don't want to say in general, more educated people, more people that are looking to including things like the environment and other nations and other surroundings, as opposed to just, you know, it's a global economy. It's a global everything right now. And to think that we can just be here in America and it's America first and America, 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 you know, fuck them. That attitude is not going to help anybody, much less the whole planet. So I don't know. I'm re- I'm telling you, those Lagunitas Maximus are kicking in, y'all. I'm just saying. <laughs> well, the Supreme Everyone. Court is a big worry. But what the part of it? In, the Supreme Court is a horrible worry. Yeah, yeah. that's true. That's true. Yeah. Oh, we're not over. We're 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 over a little bit of the hump. So I mean, but you know, and there's going to be a lot of you know. Hey, look, we got to dig out of four years of shit. So by the way, people, if you expect Biden to come in and change everything overnight. That's not the way it works. And I'll let you know with the Supreme Court and all this other stuff, they're gonna try and do it, but it's gonna be harder. So don't give up faith, don't give up hope. You know, three years from now, don't go, let's get let's get Biden the fuck out of office. You know, it's not, it's, it's time. And it's being supportive and doing what we can. And, you know, I think this country, I think on a basis is all of us, rich, poor, whatever, skin color, whatever diversity, we just want our voices to be heard. And I think once our voices are heard and people can actually understand the disenfranchised and where we're going and, and they actually genuinely want to help and show an effort in reaching out, I think we can come together. So, you know, just just look at that in life. I mean, everything, as Deanna said, is a balance. Everything. And, and, and if I may just pump up my pal's show again, that's what I really loved about Latina Christmas special is it's Diana's Christmas experience, Sandra Ball's Christmas experience, and Maria Russell's Christmas experience. And I couldn't be farther from Maria's experience, but damn, I totally related to Sandra's where she gets, you know, all these girly presents for Christmas and I'm like, I don't want the girly presents. I want the tomboy stuff. So it's like, it's it's such a cool show and it's, it's really, you know, uh, it really encompasses everything we're talking about right now. It's just like, all of our collective experiences are supposedly what makes our country great, right? You know, this melting pot, this great experiment of, yeah. of we can all get along, you know, that's... <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you said that. I'm glad you said that, Jenny, because I think that is truly why I love storytelling so much. I mean, and, and maybe this is what why I struggle sometimes as a stand-up comedian, because I want to tell the whole story. I don't want to just talk about the funny parts. Mm-hmm. Um, and... But what I love about storytelling is that by telling our stories, we all see each other's humanity more clearly. And that's one of the reasons I think you'll find, and you'll see this also on the maps that they're showing on the news, is that for some reason, the metropolitan areas, the cities, often are more democratic. And I think that's because in touch, upfront, diversity, yeah, diversity. wealth, poor, uh, middle-class uh, immigrants, being exposed to people and getting to know them. Meeting the cultures in the big yes. city. This is what leads to this mindset that it's not, it's not about my tribe versus your tribe. It's about this planet. It's, uh, it's, we're earthlings, we're humans, yeah. you know? And I think that uh, I think that that's that's the main reason I'm so passionate about storytelling is that I feel like it really makes a difference in the world if we just got to know each other better. Exactly. exactly. I like that. And on that note, I want to thank you so much, Diana, for joining us, for giving you your pearls of wisdom. <laughs> thank you. I mean, you know, you are. You know, I, I love that you can just shoot from the hip with us and and just follow our roller coaster. Um, but 
<laughs> well, sometimes we make sense and sometimes we don't, but we will <laughs> have a good time. It doesn't matter. It's a place for us to meet. Um, but um, so where can people find you? Where can people find out when the special specials coming out and when the album's coming out? You know, what I've noticed is that Instagram sure does work well for this stuff. So <laughs> uh, look me up on Instagram at Diana Yanez show, Diana Yanez, like it's written right there. I don't know if they can see that. Uh, oh, that yeah. one. <laughs> Diana Yanez show. Um, also, if you can't remember that Latina Christmas special, um, we have, uh, we are on Instagram. We're on Facebook too. There's a lot of stuff on Facebook. Uh, and we have a website. Oh, there. <laughs> How sweet. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. And um, we have, uh, you know, all the stuff we, we Uber announce it. I'm constantly uh, working on pieces that I present through Instagram. And uh, yeah, that's the, it's probably the easiest way to find out what's going on. And uh, yeah, I would love, love, love for everyone to hear our stories. I want to see that Christmas show. I do too. Yeah. There is. Oh, yeah, well, look at me. I'm just a pair of glasses. <laughs> I'm just a go pair see of over glasses. the moon. Go rent it. Go, go download oh, it. I actually saw oh, yeah. it. It's something like I was sitting here and it was during, it was like during the Halloween thing. And me and my friend, we just watch all these like little slasher movies and these bad shark movies. <laughs> and I got home and I was like, you know, oh my God, my brain, I'm going to become a psychotic killer. And I started like slip flipping through and I'm like, oh, this looks like a cute movie. And it was um, beautiful. And the next day I called her because her girlfriend like literally drove into town um, in 24 hours to surprise her. I'm like, you have to watch this movie. It's the cutest thing ever. And <laughs> in Friday. so yes, Over the Moon, watch it. Oh, how sweet. Yeah, Over the Moon, yes. Do watch Over the Moon. That you know, Where is it on Netflix? It doesn't, it doesn't get Netflix. to me directly, but it helps this wonderful woman. That's How long have you guys been have. married, by the way? Sorry? How long have you guys been married together? Uh, well, we've been together since 2007. We met while I was doing the Sensuous Woman show with Margaret Cho, and I thought I was hot stuff, and I wanted to sleep with everyone that I thought was attractive. And this special someone got me... <laughs> got me she was like no I'm not interested and I was like wait a minute something about her and uh we had dinner and I realized oh my god what a treasure I can't mess with this and that that was the beginning of it and then we've been married since 2018 so we took a good long time but um it's always been great it's nice it's to great hear to have a, a happy lesbian story <laughs> <laughs> And yeah. Jenny has one of her own too. So I know, oh my God, you guys, if, I mean, I'm sure I don't need to promote her, but Jenny McNulty, great, great comedian, great friend. Fabulous. Truly really talented person. Very Absolutely. Amazing. And thank you for introducing me. Thank you so much, Jenny McNulty. Oh, it's so wonderful. Really <laughs> Isn't it? Oh, it's wonderful to be here. Oh, thank you, darling. It's a, it's a, oh, Mara, join in. We're all adopting your accent. Let's see if you switch. Can you do an, can you do an American accent? My American accent's really bad. <laughs> oh, it's good. It's good. Can you do it again? I, w I wish I could do it, but I really can't. <laughs> Oh, come on. That's yeah. perfect. I, I'm a voice artist. Can't do it. I can't. I can't do it. Shut I up. Do it. That was perfect. That's great. I really? had to be pegged for Arizona. <laughs> I was Arizonian. Since we're on Netflix, can I do a shout out for my son? Yes. Because oh, yes. my son has a series coming out next week. It's called We Are the Champions on Netflix. He produced and directed some of the episodes. And it's really fun shows. I've seen it. It's great. We are the champions. Oh, okay. What's it about? Us on the 16th. Crazy um, competitions from around the world that you don't hear about. Like cheese rolling and uh, pepper eating. <laughs> and frog jumping. Um, it's crazy and it's fun. It, it's um, narrated by um, the guy from the office, Dwight. Oh, oh, Rain. Rain. Um, rain, uh, rain, yeah. rain. 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 What the Something. fuck is his name? Wilson. Rain Wilson. Yes, Rain Wilson. Right. Yeah. Very you funny. Know, I actually wasn't sure, but it just rolled off the tongue. It just. Yeah, I'm glad this is not an episode of Pandemic Password. <laughs> 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 
and into that, Jenny, what do you what tell us about what's going on with you? I am doing my uh, my chat show Monday through well Monday Wednesday Friday at one p.m. where I interview fun people and then we take a walk at the end and get some exercise in just mm. a little bit it just make you feel good. Uh, and then on Mondays is pandemic password. So Monday Wednesday Friday at one is my talk show and Monday at four those are all Pacific times. Y'all got to do your own math after my lago to maximus. Can't do the math so much anymore. <laughs> Uh, four are my shows and thank you and cheryl what about you uh i'm actually doing an event tomorrow night uh online that's where i that's where i am now i'm on zoom and you can check out all my events on my website mediumcheryl.com thank you and mara what are you up to besides getting skinny <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm working on a couple art projects right now. Um, I'm a writer and an artist. And um, so you can find me on marashaneart.com. Um, on Facebook, I'm Mara Shane Custom Designs. So yeah, just trying to finish a few art projects before the end of the year. Thank you. Um, everyone out there, thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back in two weeks. I have no idea who the guests will be because um, I always shoot from the hip last minute or I ask Jenny to look through her Rolodex to help me. Um, <laughs> but in any event, thank you again. We are we are who we are because of you for your support and for your listening and, and, and chiming in and following you know QTE Brett, which is my Instagram or following Between the Sheets podcast on Facebook. Um, all these shows are up, the old ones, the new ones will be up on all the podcast aggregators. And of course, there's the YouTube channel Between the Sheets with Gay and Bruno. I want to thank you, everybody. Have faith. This is the ticket. This is the ticket. This is hey, nice tits, baby. It. Oh, <laughs> no, I was trying to find a wife beater <laughs> to show them, but I did, but they didn't have one. Um, but thanks this, to my home state of Michigan, just yeah, saying. Michigan. I mean, I'm from Jersey. They they voted for they were they're Biden people. So um, you know, it's like it's let's come together. You know, let's not even have any dispersions or any bullshit and go oh those fucking Trump people or whatever. You know what? Biden's in charge. Let's support him and let's not be them because we don't want to be the Bideners and they hate us, <laughs> you know, um, you know, they have their own, let's, let's be the party. Let's be, let's unify. Cause that's what Biden and Kamala stress is uni unity. So let's just support each other. Let's support them. Um, and let's be kind and let's have compassion. And, yeah, yeah. and that's the way this world needs to be. We live in the best place in the, we really do. The United States is the best place in the whole world. So let's keep it that way. You know, eat vegan stuff. Um, so we save the planet. Um, just do <laughs> to save the, eat vegan stuff. That, that's a nod to Jenny. But I mean, seriously, let's save the planet because we are all in it together. And if we screw it up, we screw it up for not only us, but everybody else in the future. So I love you guys. Be safe, be well. We'll see you in two weeks. Thank you again, Deanna and my Thank girls. You. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Monday, you know, hopefully before Monday, but Monday we'll have a president and, um, and a good one at that. So thank you guys. Be safe, be well, as I said, and um, namaste. Namaste. Cue the music. Ha, 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 ha.